Hey everybody, I finally got a chance to see The Wind Rises, a movie I've been looking forward to for quite some time. And unless he has a last minute change of heart, the last movie from Hayao Miyazaki. And yeah, I've been looking forward to this pretty much ever since it got the Oscar nomination. And now that I've finally seen it, very good. I really like this one. Uh, and if this is Miyazaki's swan song, I think we can say he went out on a high note. Uh, it's not a perfect movie. Um, in fact, I wouldn't even say it's his best work. Uh, it's up there, but probably not his best work. Definitely not my personal favorite, but still very solid film. Uh, the basic story behind this is, a uh, it's a fictionalized account of the life of Jiro Horikoshi, uh, an airplane engineer who worked for Mitsubishi in the years leading up to World War II who designed many of the airplanes that were used by Japan during the war, uh, including the, uh, the Mitsubishi Zero, I think it was called, that was used by the uh, kamikaze fighters. And uh, the movie begins with Jiro as a child who dreams of becoming a pilot someday, but unfortunately, because of his poor eyesight, he realizes that there's no way that's ever gonna happen. So he figures if he can't become a pilot, he's going to design the airplanes for other people to fly and enjoy. And so he, at a very young age, he starts reading aircraft engineering magazines and stuff, and he goes on to study at university to become an engineer and eventually lands a job at Mitsubishi and puts his ingenuity to work. And uh, the, it's very interesting to see the way he comes up with some of his designs. Like there's a moment where he's, you know, trying to, figure out a better design for an airplane wing, and he actually gets the idea while he's having lunch by looking at the curvature of a fishbone. And I don't know how historically accurate that is, or if that's just poetic license, but you know, still very interesting to see his creativity at work there. Also very interesting to hear him constantly lament about how Japan is always 10 or 20 years behind in the terms of technology, while everyone else has moved on to making metal airplanes, they're still making them out of wood. And after they make the planes, they have to use oxen to pull them from the construction site to the test site. And it's kind of funny to think about that in terms of the present day, because nowadays you would never hear anyone say Japan is 10 years behind technologically. That's, no, if anything, they're always on top. That's, that's where we get most of our technology. But, you know, it's a good reminder that that wasn't always the case. And yeah, it's very interesting to look back on that. Uh, and the other thing he constantly laments is how all he wants to do is just live out his dream of designing aircraft. But he knows that he's working for a government contractor and at some point his beautiful machines that he's designing could be used to uh, do some very, very ugly things. And in fact, he also has a lot of uh, dreams throughout the movie where he talks with an Italian engineer named Caproni, who was his idol growing up. And they both talk about how, you know, all they want to do are just design these beautiful machines for people to enjoy, but they know that beauty can very easily be corrupted and turned into something ugly. Now, they don't actually show any of the airplanes being used in the war. Uh, in fact, the movie ends before the war even begins, which has drawn a bit of criticism from some people who think that they should have actually gone all the way and shown the type of destruction that these airplanes could show. I think I understand why Miyazaki didn't go all the way with that. Um, and if anyone out there has a better understanding of Japanese culture, which is probably a good number of people, by all means correct me if I'm wrong, but to my understanding, World War II is still kind of a sore spot with Japan. They don't like to talk about it. They don't like to talk about the atrocities committed by Japan during the war. And I'm certainly not suggesting Japan was alone in that. There were a lot of countries that did a lot of very bad things. Germany and even America. We did level Hiroshima and Nagasaki. That was not a beautiful moment by any means. That was very, very ugly. So, but I'm just saying, 
they don't like to talk about that. So I think I understand why Miyazaki didn't want to go that way, even though he has certainly not shied away from talking about that sort of thing in interviews. If he put that in the movie, he almost certainly would have sabotaged it because a film that shows that kind of stuff probably would not have found an audience in Japan. So I would have liked to see more of that as well, just to, you know, further get the message across about how beauty can so easily be corrupted. But I get why he didn't go there. And now the other part of the movie is the focus on his personal life, um, which to my understanding is mostly fiction. The, the focus on his professional life and his design of the airplanes is at least chronologically correct, uh, but the stuff about his personal life is uh, mostly just made up for the movie. While he's attending university, studying to become an engineer, he gets caught up in the Great Earthquake of 1923. Uh, and that is one part of the movie that does not shy away from destruction and terror. That is genuinely horrifying to watch as the ground just starts violently shaking and fires spring up everywhere and just level half the city. It's, it's terrifying and about as terrifying as I'm sure it would have been to actually live through that. And during that time, he encounters a, a, a young girl and her maid and actually helps them get to a place of safety after the earthquake. And then he just leaves without even introducing himself properly. And a few years later, he just happens to meet this girl again, and they fall madly in love and decide that they want to get married. Oh, but there's a problem. She's dying. This is where the movie gets just a little too melodramatic for my taste. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's a bit cheesy and it's horribly cliched. Just, just as soon as she tells him that she's dying, without even hesitating one second, he just says, well, then we'll just have to treasure every moment we have left. Ugh. God damn it. I bit, bit too melodramatic for my taste, like I said. But for what it is, it's handled very well. And uh, honestly, some of the scenes between them are genuinely charming. If a bit overdone. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's the basic story. Um, now, as far as the voice acting goes, I did see the English dub, uh, which generally that's what I prefer because... Obviously, I'm a native English speaker. I prefer to see movies in my own language, if possible. Uh, unless the dub is really, really bad. But thankfully, that is not the case here. I thought the dub overall was very well done. I liked Joseph Gordon-Levitt as Jiro. I thought he did a very good job with that character. Um, Martin Short plays the voice of a character called Kurokawa, who was Jiro's boss at Mitsubishi, and is... Almost seems to be inspired a bit by Mr. Spacely from the Jetsons, I think. He's, you know, you know a, a real hard-ass in the workplace, and he's even really short like Mr. Spacely, much shorter than everyone else in the office. And uh, although, well, while he is a bit of a hard-ass and is, you know, constantly yelling at his employees, y you can still tell that even though he doesn't like to show it, there's still, underneath it all, he still respects Jiro and what he's doing even though he won't admit it in public. Um, and that this leads to some very funny moments with the character, and I, I really liked it, and I liked Martin Short's performance. Uh, Stanley Tucci does the voice of Caproni, the Italian engineer that Jiro meets in his dreams. Uh, really liked him in, in that role. Uh, Mae Whitman was probably the only actual voice actor whose name I recognized in the credits. Uh, Again, these animated films always seem to focus on getting regular actors to do their work instead of actual voice actors because it gives them some more famous names to put on the marquee. Uh, so it's nice to see some actual voice actors getting work here. And yeah, Whitman actually plays uh, Jiro's sister, Kayo. It's a relatively small part, but when she's on screen, she does well. Um, as far as the animation... It's Ghibli, you know it's going to be awesome, and it is. It is downright fucking gorgeous. Just seeing the 
variation in the designs of these airplanes and the, the uh, very creative designs that Jiro keeps seeing in his dreams and you know all the devastation from the 1923 earthquake the incredible detail and in all the snowflakes that are falling in the winter and even in just you know the visual of a spinning propeller looks so authentic and so detailed everything oh god it's so sad that this is his last movie and we're just oh man just I'm, i just cannot say enough good things about the animation there's i i cannot find fault with it at all there's nothing bad to say about it at all nothing now i also would like to talk about something that i wouldn't normally talk about with this so this type of movie and that is the sound um for a good number of the sound effects in this movie miyazaki apparently decided that instead of you know getting pre-recorded sound effects or you know synthetic sounds or what have you he actually recorded them using human voices so like whenever you see a propeller spinning up you, it's actually sounds like someone just standing in front of a microphone and going you know you see a cloud of steam erupting you hear psh, psh, stuff like that and certainly an unusual decision and very interesting very creative uh certainly uh, something that you would not normally see, and one might even say it's, you know, innovative and even courageous to use such an unorthodox method of generating sound effects. And basically what I'm getting at is I didn't like it. I really, really did not like it. And I may be in the minority on this, but I just... It's... Honestly, it, it really took me out of the movie a couple of times. And, I mean, fortunately, the animation and the story and the voice acting were strong enough that it didn't ruin anything for me. I was able to look past it for the most part. And, and it's not throughout the entire movie. It's just in certain parts. But when it crops up, it is very noticeable and, at least for me, very jarring. And overall, this is probably... At least, at least based on the Miyazaki movies I've seen, I admit I haven't seen them all, but based on what I've seen, this may be his most mature film to date. And those, you know, psh, psh, all that stuff just sounds so childish by comparison. It's really, it just does not fit. You know, when I'm Watching what's supposed to be a serious movie, I should not be reminded of a comedy sketch on a Prairie Home Companion. I, it just, my brain could not get around that, and judging by a few giggles that I heard in the theater whenever these sound effects cropped up, I certainly was not alone in that regard. And, you know, I know just reading a few reviews online, a lot of people haven't even mentioned this at all, and a few that have have actually been positive about it, so... Like I said, I may be in the minority on this, but that's my honest opinion. I didn't really care for it. But the movie is strong enough that even if you have a problem with this, you can easily get past it. Um, I would definitely recommend this movie. It's, like I said, it's one of Miyazaki's better efforts. It's uh, not very heavy on the fantasy aspect. It's, you know, very grounded in reality, so don't expect something like... Totoro or Princess Mononoke, but uh, yeah, more, more in line with uh, actually with the last Ghibli film uh, from Up on Poppy Hill, but still very enjoyable and tells a very good story about, you know, innovation and creativity, uh, something that Miyazaki himself has definitely been known for. And as I said, if this is his final film, he went out on a high note. Uh, I would definitely say this is more of a movie for adults than it is for children. I don't know that there's anything overtly wrong with taking children to see this, at least maybe if they're like pre-teenage and up. Small children will almost certainly be bored out of their minds. Um, it's 
not overly violent or sexual or anything like that. Uh, there, there is one very brief scene where there's a little bit of blood when, uh, you know, the, the woman that's dying has a, a lung hemorrhage and coughs up a bit of blood, but it's very brief. Um, there is a whole lot of smoking in this movie. Every motherfucker in this movie is a chain smoker, I swear. Oh, there's r rarely a scene where someone's not having a cigarette. But, uh, so, you know, use your best judgment if you think your kids can handle it. But most likely, your kids are just going to be bored. Um, unless they're really into airplanes. So it, it's definitely a, a movie with an adult audience in mind. And I think that's about all I got to say about The Wind Rises. So now that we're done talking about something relatively serious, let's move on to something silly. So, uh, last time I did a vlog, the one I did for uh, Mr. Peabody and Sherman, I asked you to leave in the comments various nouns and verbs and adjectives and body parts and what have you. And the reason for this is last month was my birthday, and a friend of mine decided to get me a very silly present. A book of Star Wars Mad Libs. And I thought I should share this with all of you. And I freely admit this is more for my own personal enjoyment than anything else, but hopefully you'll get some entertainment out of this as well. So anyway, I took all of your suggestions and put them into a few lists while uh, removing any duplicate entries. Uh, a lot of you did select fingers as the plural body parts. It's an obvious choice, I guess. Um, and while, of course, someone did have to say penis for the singular body part, I was a bit surprised that for the plural body part, no one said boobies. Not one of you. And I'm not entirely certain if I should be relieved or disappointed. Perhaps a bit of both, I don't know. But in any case, I selected a bunch of them at random, and this is what we ended up with. So, here we go. This story is The Power of the Force. The Force is a mystical, annoying power. As Jedi Master Obi-Wan Kenobi once said, the Force is an energy field created by all living fire hydrants that surrounds us, penetrates us, and binds the corn together. So, the Force is the cob? Who knew? Using the power of the Force, a Jedi can do many dirty things. Oh my. Like using the Force to exercise mouth control, oh, that can be dirty, over horny-minded fashionistas. <laughs> okay, a Jedi can also use the Force to move objects with his or her breast. Oh, this did get dirty. It doesn't matter how loquacious these objects are. Look it up. It only matters how sarcastically the Jedi believes in the Force. Oh, sure it does. Most importantly, the Force teaches a Jedi to rely on his or her feelings. As Obi-Wan Kenobi told his student, Luke Tuxedo Walker, Your earlobes can deceive you. Don't trust them. Now that is so true. You can never trust your earlobes. These bitches can't trust them any farther than you can throw them. No, no. Instead, a Jedi should regretfully trust in the Force. Use the Force, Luke. If you have to. I guess. And that is the power of the Force, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you enjoyed that as much as I enjoyed making it. And if you want me to do another one, let me know. If not, well, fine, then I won't. So there. Take care. <laughs>